Hello, everybody, and welcome uh, to Ideas by Interpreters, episode number 15. Today, we have with us Robin Pierce. Um, she's on the line. Robin, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can hear you very well. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. So welcome, and thank you for being here with us today. Um, Robin is, is an ASL as well as spoken uh, interpreter, and so she has um, sort of perspective from both sides, and it's going to be Today we're going to be talking about the similarities and differences between the, the technique and the different cultures of signed and spoken languages. So um, let's get started. Robin, if you want to just introduce yourself, uh, maybe give a little bit of background on uh, your experience with interpreting. Oh, I should say. I am not really a spoken language interpreter. I have had dealings with spoken language interpreters for many, many years. I have been a certified ASL interpreter for over 40, which uh, I was sure I was certified when I was in diapers. But um, the thing with spoken languages, it's, I have been in many international conferences. I have worked in many venues uh, living in the Southwest where we've had spoken language interpreters and signed interpreters. Uh, I have been very involved with organizations, the Texas Association of Judiciary Interpreters and Translators, the, you know, the national equivalent and, uh, and, and other smaller groups. But uh, one of the things that I find is the, the spoken language interpreters and the sign language interpreters are almost like two completely different animals, and it's not true. Uh, so I want to try to mend the rift a little bit and uh, bring people together and show we are a lot more similar than a lot of people think and know. And mm -hmm. the differences are very minor. Eh. Okay, great. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, of course, if you've been working in the industry for for so long you've been exposed to all different types of interpretation and assignments and so it's it's great to have your your background and experience in that so um let's get started the presentation one second all righty so we're going to talk about first how are they different i mean i know we were saying there's so many similarities obviously there are but there are, are also some differences. And one of the differences we can talk about um, with Robin is, is the modality, the way in which they're communicated. Well, obviously, um, as I don't see the slide, but I, I is it up there? Oh, okay, says, hold on a sec. How are we different? Yeah. There we go, should be showing now. Okay, yay, okay. Um, I said spoken and signed that you know one is, is with your hands and the other is spoken language the process is the same going from uh, crossing hemispheres uh, as we transition from one language to the other uh, is basically the same uh, and you'll notice the it's, for example, braille displays. And there are also, uh, this is visual and audio. Um, and also there are uh, gloves, for example, that when you sign, it is still in development stage, but somebody can sign and then the computer will actually speak and say what's being signed. That's very interesting technology to see um, the, haptics that she that are on that screen so that that's interesting yeah, I've never one seen of, that before wow mm -hmm. one of the big differences well said are sign language is universal no spoken languages are not universal it's the same thing and they are so culturally developed uh, we had talked about um, for example the sign for a house now our American sign language the sign for a house is is a a steepled, you know, you put your fingers together and uh, show the rooftop to the house. Now that's American Sign Language, even though in the Southwest, for those of us, that's not always true. But that leads to, in Mexico, for example, the sign for a house is a flat roof, and then you show the signs, the sides. So it's very culturally 
generated. Uh, many of the nonverbal communications become signs. And uh, there's a, a book in sign language called Mind to Sign. And it shows how many of the things that we do, even like the shrugging of the shoulders, is really a very common sign for I don't know. And <laughs> so people sign a lot more than they than they think they do. Um, another big difference, and this is one of the things that ASL interpreters often almost fall into an advocate role. Maybe not strictly and you have to be very careful but we've talked a lot about cults called cross-cultural communication and cross-cultural advocacy and as interpreters we will often tell someone you know tell the doctor well the question that you are asking is is very culturally inappropriate in this person's language um, and, and it's exactly the same. People don't realize that the deaf people will have a very different culture. And sometimes it does correspond with the culture of their community uh, living in the Southwest. A lot of the deaf people, we did a survey talking about for the deaf Hispanic community, did they identify first being Hispanic and then being deaf or did they identify being deaf and then being Hispanic and it's interesting that generally people identified being deaf first deaf culture and then Hispanic culture was second but in pockets for example where I live in San Antonio Texas the culture here it's Hispanic first and then deaf so why is that why Quite is that? The case. That's it. yeah. Interesting. yeah, it's very interesting. Um, but one of the things too, why the deaf people tend to identify with deaf culture as opposed to the culture that they are raised in, the biggest thing and why the interpreters so often have to be a little more advocates is because they're often If you are a Spanish interpreter or if you're a Vietnamese interpreter or a Thai interpreter, when you see the family in the room, you're going to assume that the family all speaks the same language as the patient. Um, you know, some of them will speak English, some of them will not. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but when you have a deaf person in that room, chances are the family is not going to be able to sign. They may be having a very rudimentary gestural system and people go, oh, no, the family signs and you go, no, they don't. Yeah, that's a really interesting point that, <clears throat> you know, it's and it definitely goes to, to show that as the ASL interpreter, you have to be more of an advocate for the patient. Yeah. And, you know, and we have to be very careful and I, I know sometimes people don't quite understand because you, you can't become, well, here, let me back up a little bit. Often the hearing person in this deaf person's life has been the person with all the answers. Uh, the teacher, you've gone to school, there's a teacher, the teacher tells you what to do, where to go, how to do it. And then, um, um, that's what you do. And when a person then is, especially a young adult, uh, their parents make all the decisions. You'd be amazed how many people have no idea about their family history. They have no idea about, um, you know, their own history, for example. Yeah. You've been in the, ho you were in the hospital last year. What for? Oh, I don't know. Ask my mother. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And and you run into that so often. Um, it, it's just and and then again, it's the difference of the mother usually doesn't sign. So you really can't pass the information on. You don't know anything about your family. You know, your uncle has cancer. Do you know that? You know, your uncle's sick, but you have no idea what it is. It makes it very difficult for a patient to give a doctor a, a good history. 
I yeah. did have. I, I did have a couple of questions though, um, and I suppose that all we can do is answer in the comments. But yeah, yeah, I have the questions here, and I can read them out, uh, or the answers okay. to the questions you're gonna you're gonna ask. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, the question, first question. Um, let's see if I if I hopefully I don't get these backwards now. Um, <laughs> uh, how many? I was trying to, how many people have worked with ASL interpreters or if you're an ASL interpreter, worked with a spoken language interpreter? I'm trying to decide, it, the bigger number, I don't want all the 50 answers to suddenly pop up, but uh, if right. it's easier to, is it easier to ask how many people have not or how many people have? I think just in general, uh, you know, if, if, you're, if your specialty is spoken, um, have you have you worked with ASL and, and vice versa? So uh, from the from the audience here, can you guys give us an uh, an idea of that? I'm just waiting for some answers. <laughs> okay. Um, I know that in my in my background as a Spanish uh, language interpreter, mm -hmm. I I'm for me the the ASL world, you know, admittedly is is kind of unknown for me um i know that may not they may not be the case with a lot of a lot of interpreters because they've worked more on site a lot of the work i've done has been remote um but uh yeah no we've got one comment here some uh one of the interpreters here is a trained asl interpreter uh working as a spoken interpreter until her asl asl skills improve so that's that's interesting um you know, you, you, you keep up with the, the technique, but then you also are learning a new trade. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that a good amount of the on-site interpreters have experience um, in both, or ex experience being exposed to both. Um, okay. If you're remote, it might be a different story. Okay. Well, then let me ask my next question. I don't want to make this too elementary, but I don't want to assume that you know information that's not. Anyways, who has interpreted less than 10 years? I'm gonna guess the majority of the of the okay. people on here. Then who has interpreted for less than five years? Let me bring the number down. <laughs> um we've got a, a couple people saying um that they've been interpreting for Two to three years, uh, some five to seven, um, seven again. So it's a range. It's really a okay. range. We've got okay. people who've been interpreting for twelve plus years as well. So, um, but That's you know, smart. I think it's. I think it's. I don't think you're gonna be too rudimentary. I think it's. It's. You know, all of the information is gonna be welcome. Okay. Um, you want to go to the next slide? Okay. Okay. Um, sign language interpreters tend not to have a glossary. Uh, if you're a spoken language interpreter, you can usually use glossaries. Uh, you can have dictionaries with you and, and take notes. That's one of the things. And when you're a sign interpreter, you have none. You do not have the option to do any of those things. Um, now, we work with partners a lot. And that's some of the things that people, it's like, why do you have to have two interpreters? It's only an hour and a half. Um, well, Carolyn and I had talked about this and it's like, put your arms in front of you and spin them in circles. And now continue and do that for an hour. And um, then you, yeah. you have to make your brain work at the same time. And by the time you've passed a half an hour, you start getting a little foggy and fuzzy. Um, yeah, and uh, not to mention physically exhausted. <laughs> yes, right. physically you're exhausted, yes. Uh, uh, there have been quite a few studies, and actually interpreters, 20 to 30 minutes, after about 20 minutes, you start losing your ability to accurately translate. Uh, I'm sure everybody realizes that after about a half an hour, you are definitely ready to be replaced by somebody else. Um, even spoken language interpreters. 
uh, it, it is the same thing. It's, it's very important, depending on the complexity. Doctor's appointment, you spend so much downtime, that's not important. But if you're doing a lecture or if you are interpreting a conference, and the, the longer you work and the more your brain is having to process, after a while your processing starts to slow down. Now, inter ASL interpreters, since we can't do note taking, which is, which is nice if you're able to put down, okay, this guy's name is Ted and you keep calling him Frank. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> and so it's one of the things working with a partner, the partner may take a note. Um, they may keep the name. So if when it comes up and me as an interpreter, I'm about a sentence behind, uh, depending on, again, the complexity of the subject, my partner, can either can feed the term to me. So you have a note taker as your partner. So you it's not like as a as the person who's off, I can you know go out and take a smoke break of, even though nobody does that anymore. Um, <laughs> uh, every once in a while, you know, I run out to the bathroom and then run right back. But that's about uh, as much of a break as you get. But you'll see these pictures. One of the things that we do is since we don't really have a glossary. I have, I have made notebooks and I will have, um, I have one for employment type of job assignments where I'll have different, different jobs and what they look like because working with people, again, I'm sure you run into the same thing as a spoken language interpreter. You know, some people are very articulate and other people are not. Um, in sign language, for example, there are no signs for parts of the body. You have the heart, the lungs, and you can indicate the stomach. The kidneys kind of have a sign, but if a person has had kidney problems, then they'll know the sign. If they haven't had kidney problems, they probably don't. So that's how, you know, you, exposure enhances your vocabulary. And, and I'm sure that all of us find the same thing. You know, we may know nothing about nephrology, but we've interpreted for a patient who goes to the nephrologist. And it's amazing how much we learn from all of this. Um, but I have a medical notebook and pictures like this are very important. If the doctor is talking about, well, you have a bladder infection. Okay. You know, you, you get a lot of head nodding. Okay. I have a bladder infection. So, and often the doctor will then just go on assuming the person knows what a bladder is. And uh, one of the pictures I will usually I also have the Gray's Anatomy full figure. So you can say, okay, here's your bladder. And now this is what this is. And if I even have, I definitely don't carry it with me, but I have the selected uh, pictures from it. If I know that I'm going to the cardiologist, I'll be a little more heavy on heart pictures. If I know I'm going to the nephrologist, I'll be a little more heavy on kidneys and, and bladders and whatever else may be involved. Um, so, you know, pictures like this are important because there are not really signs. And when I go to the doctor's office, the doctor will say, oh, well, you have a, a, you have a scarred liver. And there's, you know, the head nod again, and you can, you know, and, and so this is where the interpreter liver, and sometimes me, since I can't really say, do you know what the liver is? Because it's not my place as the interpreter. Now, how I may get around it, since I can't ask that question, I may get around it by saying, do you know a sign, do you use a, a sign for liver? And when, you know, there's complete, uh, I have no idea, I've never heard that word, I don't know what it is. I say, oh, this, and I can show a picture. And, and you know, it's all as fast as it is for you looking up a term. So that's one of the things that, um, you know, that's, that's one of the things that, um, um, that works fairly well. And 
So anyway, that's that's our form of using glossaries, is our glossaries are usually pictorial, and this is a perfect example of it. Um, luckily, Carolyn found this picture for me. She was just wonderful. Um, <laughs> well, what's so our I next want, slide? I wanted to ask you quickly. So you mentioned there are there are signs for some body parts, but for most of the internal organ and organs, there are not. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. I'm just curious. I was in, yes. I was interested. Yeah. <laughs> All, right. All right. And like there is a sign for the heart, but there's a sign for the heart. And if you are talking about the heart, okay. Well, you have a valve. You know, you have a valve that's that's not functioning correctly. <coughs> Excuse me, we have everything blooming here right now. Um, it is so much easier. Sometimes the doctors will have a picture and they'll have diagrams and they'll have models of the heart and they can go through and show everything and that's wonderful. But I am just astounded at how often they do not. So, you know, I, I will, you know, get out my heart picture and say, you know, the valve and I can, there isn't really a sign for a valve, but I can use classifiers which are hand shapes that indicate um, uh, different configurations um, uh, you know a I can use a classifier to indicate a, a valve that opens and closes but a picture is so much better to be able to show now this this is the valve and then you have to do a lot of signing to to indicate how this works and hopefully you have a good doctor who also is going to be very descriptive so that you don't have to be, you know, as the interpreter, step out of your role because that is, that is a very fine line that, right. that we run into. Yeah, I can imagine. All right, let's uh, move on to the next slide in uh, the interest of time. Yes. So simultaneous and consecutive. Uh, well, what can we say about that? ASL interpreters are almost always simultaneous, where spoken language interpreters most of the time are going to be consecutive unless you're doing a platform conference courtroom type setting. Uh, is that what, uh, does anybody have any settings in mind that I have, that I am overlooking? Uh, for for uh, consec or sorry simultaneous yeah. interpreting for, yeah for simultaneous for spoken language others other than conferences and that kind of thing yeah. um, that's us that's the most common use case I would say yeah. Yeah. yeah and and when and what you need to do is you'll get a <laughs> I laugh at the linguistic terminology you clump your language so you clump <laughs> your concept and you know, um, what's your problem while you're here today? Um, and right. then they'll hold it while you will then ask the question. Well, at signing, we are usually fairly simultaneous, but again, understanding that depending on the complexity of the, of the concept that we're discussing, we are from a few signs, a few concepts to possibly up to a sentence, sometimes even more than that behind because you have to get the whole concept before you can sign it or you may sign incorrect concepts and then have to go back and do it again. And uh, yeah, uh, that does not work very well. But um, it, it is, again, we are just taking the language and we're going from one language to the other. Uh, as a sign language interpreter, I laugh because uh, I can tell doctors that are used to working with spoken language interpreters because they will go. Uh, and so, and they wait and they wait and I say, oh, go ahead, please. I'll be simultaneous. And and, and they just keep stopping, especially stopping at, at strange places, which I'm sure you run into all the time. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. it's, it's it's it is nice as a spoken interpreter when they when they are aware that you have to do it consecutively. But um, you know, oh. for an ASL interpreter, I do I do yeah. see why that could be kind of cumbersome. Yeah, and and where people stop, it's like, well, that's nice that you're stopping to have me interpret, but uh, I need a little more <laughs> to get that concept. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting because it's it's about concepts. It's not necessarily about words, right? So correct. Yeah. Um, 
so they have to work, you know, the, yeah. they have to finish the concept, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, and a lot of people think that signing is just an Eng a sign language gloss on English, and it's not. It's a grammatically completely different language. Um, uh, actually, it is fairly close to French and Hebrew in grammatical construction. Really? That's interesting. Uh, uh, so, and I, I had always learned, known that it was very similar to French, and I was so surprised when probably about 10 years ago, um, uh, linguistic studies came out talking about how similar it is to Hebrew. And I thought, oh, well, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, but I must say that by being a sign interpreter, when I took Spanish, Most of the other students, most of a, most of the other gringos and gringas in the class, um, <laughs> had a very difficult time with ya. Yeah. And actually, that is perfect because there is a sign that expresses that it's a time indicator and it's perfect and help is. And I laugh uh -huh. because I, I would interpret under the desk while I was in class. I would interpret to myself <laughs> because it, it, you know, two sides of the brain working at the same time. Yeah. Hey, extra memory. And when she did that, that was the one concept I laughed because I thought, I got it. <laughs> that yeah, is easy to understand. Yeah. Right. It is a concept. I mean, yeah, as in, as in um, happening right now or, hap yeah. or or in the moment. It's mm -hmm. not something we have, we usually um, distinguish in, in, in English. So it's, it's definitely something that that I understand you would understand better as an ASL interpreter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. I uh, just was going to move on to the next slide. Yes. Well, actually, the next set of slides go together. Okay. Um, Got it. The code of professional conduct, the, conduct, the code of ethics, um, this is more for, for your information so that you mm -hmm. have something like this. You can just look at it and see. There are very few differences. We are basically all the same animal. Um, you want to have your professional skills and knowledge. You, you need to make sure that you are up for this assignment that you take. If you have had no legal training, you have no business in the courtroom. Um, and working with mentors is excellent. Um, some people feel very awkward about that, especially after they've been interpreting for many years. They don't think that they should have to. But in a new area, there is absolutely nothing wrong with working with someone who is more skilled and learning from them. Um, conduct yourself in a manner appropriate to the specific interpreting situation. Uh, if you are in a courtroom, you conduct yourself one way. If you're in a classroom and you're out doing a field trip through the, uh, uh, through the ranch uh, studying animal husbandry, uh, you may conduct yourself a little differently and certainly dress differently. Um, I laugh because I had to do those two things in one day and it was like, okay, oh. you know, wash my brain. <laughs> okay, now I am now going, you know, and luckily I went, I did the cows first and then I did the court because uh, I think that it would have been very, it, it, it probably, it may have been easier going the other way around, but for me, I, I was just ready. Okay. I had a nice casual morning and then all afternoon had to be very, very structured and, and very staid. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, you have to change your, change your chip, your brain chip, basically. <laughs> Absolutely. But basically, um, let's see. And it's interesting. You, you want me to move on to the other yeah. one so we can kind yeah. of compare? Yeah, just move down. Because so this, this one, is, the, this is RID, so it's register Registry yeah. of the Interpreters for the Deaf. So yeah. just to compare, um, this is the uh, some of the information from Code of Ethics from Najit. Mm -hmm. um, and you and can see the number one and everything is confidentiality, or at least the top few confidentiality. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, those are all all um, ethical terms that we, you know, as interpreters, whether you're spoken or 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 ASL or sign sign interpreter, um, 
need to follow. Yeah. And again, protocol and demeanor, maintenance, improvements of your skills and knowledge. Um, I always thought it's interesting, accurate representation of your credentials. That's one of the things that I push all the time, especially in court is always ask the interpreter for the credentials. And as an, you know, you should have a card or something proving that you have credentials to be in court in particular. But then, um, then the IMIA, Yes. You know, again, the, the same thing, you know, confidentiality, um, select the language and mode that most accurately conveys the content and spirit of the message. Um, and for us, for example, the ASL interpreters, it may be, you know, pictorial or it may be a, a lot of gesture or, you know, a very, very formalized sign. It all depends on the person. And so I know everybody it faces that exact same thing. Um, and, and I always like this one, you'll use skillful, unobtrusive intervention so as not to interfere with the flow of communication. Um, I, as, as a part of my interpreter training was inter, training us to be a wallflower. And I always thought that was a funny term. But, mm -hmm. you know, we are to blend in, blend into the scenery and, you know, not, well, I don't want everybody looking at me. I want every, you know, the two clients talking to each other and I am just, um, and, and, you it's know, almost I, like, yeah. it's almost like you're the, you're the vessel, right? I mean, you're not, <laughs> you're yeah. not trying to take over. You're just there to, um, portray the message, right? Mm -hmm. For the, yes. Um, okay. yeah, so, certifications um, mm -hmm. will vary obviously but I think mm -hmm. it's interesting to look at you know the way things are moving for certifications for ASL in particular just because um, with VRI becoming so widespread more and more states are requiring state specific um, licensures yes um, and so I know licenses or registrations right and so I know Robin you have you have quite a, a few uh, licensures yourself endorsements as well and i was wondering if you could kind of talk about what what that means what what that what opportunities that opens up for you yeah. Yeah. working vri in particular but even if i go do on-site jobs in different locations um having a the state license actually covers me it covers the agency i'm working for i get concerned about vri and if i suddenly find we are in a state i have a list of each state and what their uh, licensure requirements are uh, our id is national certification but national certification suddenly is not sufficient many of the states and i'm not quite sure why now since bei is next let me say bei started out as a texas certification and more and more states started when they started expanding wanting to have their own certification system their own state system uh what they did was they reached out and texas started uh, setting up the bei in different states and I cannot remember how many states actually offer BEI certification, but 47 states recognize it. So mm -hmm. if I if I um, go to to most states, uh, said Arizona, Michigan, Pennsylvania, they have state licensures that are very strict. But I took my RID card and I took my BEI card, and and actually my endorsements, which I'll talk about next. And once I presented them, then I was awarded the, the state license. So that was no problem. But I am not exactly sure why all the states have started requiring licensure. But, but in the past probably five to 10 years, it has become almost, um, <clears throat> oh, well, 
uh, almost every state now requires some type of, if it's not their license, you at least have to register if you're working in that state. Some of them are free, which is nice. Uh, but a lot of them you have to pay anything from $10 to 150 And so that definitely adds up quickly. Yeah, definitely. Um, the endorsements are, are what... Now, the, the endorsements are what I see coming down the pike for everybody. And with the uh, 1557... Um, of the, you can tell I'm tired today. Um, no uh, the, yeah, the amendment 50, 1557 states that to interpret in medical situations, a certification is not sufficient. You have to prove that you have the additional training in the medical field to make you appropriate to interpret for this doctor. And so this is what I really do see coming for everybody. And right now, Michigan offers endorsements and you have to prove that you have had, in the last four years, you have to have had 10 years. And let me check my facts, but you have to, in the last four years, you have to have had at least 10 hours of medical training. And they also have the legal endorsement and they have the mental health endorsement and plus they have an education one for educational interpreters. So that is what you, what I see coming. If you're going to be a medical interpreter, you're going to have to get an endorsement and who is going to be um, doing these certifications. I'm not quite sure, but I know ASL already is very strict on, on needing certification and now more and more places are wanting endorsements. So, and I, I said, that's why I said, I, I see this coming. And so it might be something you think about, you know, start saving all your certificates from all of your training so that um, you can, when this does come up, you can say, Oh, well, I have this training in, in medical. I have this training in legal. I have, Oh, here I have at least, 15 hours in, in medical, so that's no problem. So make sure that you save your save your certificates, and uh, you know. And it's funny for webinars like this. What I do is I save um, the announcement of the webinar, and then mm -hmm. the uh, login when they send you the okay, you've been confirmed. Here it is. Um, and I save those two and put them together because we don't really get certificates for these, but it does, it, it does help to at least be able to prove, well, I have taken so many hours, so many one hour trainings. Right. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it's, it's just the way it's going. I, and I think it has to do with, with the way that um, technology is playing a part. You know, it's, it's, it's wanting to become more specific um, for each type of field you're, you're working in, because when you're in VRI, you can, you can work in so many different, you know, at different places. You can work you, from home. You can work, but you can work in in healthcare. You can work in in legal settings. Yeah. Um, but you need to be able to prove that you are um, experienced. So yeah. that's just where yeah, things are getting. You may, yeah, you may have a, a school come up one time, and then your next calls a court, and your next calls a doctor's appointment, and and you never. That's the thing about on-site, at least you can say, oh, look up this doctor. Oh, I am going to a cardiologist. You can refresh your, your cardiology terminology where suddenly it pops up on VRI. It's like, oh, surprise. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you have to have all of your all of your resources available to you at all times. Yes. Um, let's move on because we're getting short yeah. on time and I want to answer a couple questions. Yes. Um, so, yeah, just to talk about, you know, spoken language certifications, which is also, I mean, I, I do think this is a another animal. I know we, we say that there's a lot yeah. of similarities, but um, mm. spoken language, because there's so many different languages out there, it's it's become more and more um, pressing the need to have certifications for languages of lesser diffusion, for example. Um, 
So, you know, that's why Bruce Lingo partners with, with organizations like CCHI who are actively um, working on, on um, exams and testing that's going to make it possible for, uh, for the languages of lesser diffusion to have, have certifications. Um, and yeah, of course, each entity is going to have its own uh, definitions, but they all mm -hmm. do share similarities like we showed you um, mm -hmm. with their code of ethics and with their <clears throat> clauses, what it means to be a qualified interpreter. Mm -hmm. So um, do we have anything else? Next week we have a training. Uh, it's just gonna be with me, but it's gonna be a, um, it's gonna be a review of best practices, refresher training on, on remote interpreting. Um, and I'll be there to answer any questions people have on the platform on because um, I know there's new features added all the time. Maybe you have questions. Um, but yeah, I want to I want to thank Robin for being here. It's been great hearing all of your experiences and um, let's see if we have any particular questions at this time. Um, I have an interpreter here asking. Uh, you know, they're, they're starting out in their ASL training. They're currently a spoken interpreter. Um, what are some good online resources to, to practice? If you have any ideas. Real life interaction is always the best thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and if I... If I can be self-serving, um, uh, you'll notice that my um, my email address is Robin at the silent network TV. Yeah, we'll uh, go back to the first slide just to yeah. refresh everybody of that. Yeah. And um, here it is. Uh, this is uh, there are other programs, but there is a whole track of it. And it's not ASL meaning instruction it's not asl instructional tapes but it's uh like the the program coming up this week is an interview with uh, a deaf engineer at toyota uh there's a deaf artist there are you know, it's all done you know so it's all done in sign language and that is a good way to to watch signs improve your sign language uh learn different dialects um there are some older shows um uh, if you have dogs or cats, there's a Hear Kitty Kitty, which is uh, teaches you about your cat, and Hear Dog, which teaches you about dog training, and they're all done ASL. There is a um, comedy show called um, ASL Cafe. And ASL Cafe, if you're wanting to practice your signs and practice your voicing, there is one, one track that is... Um, Everything is cap everything is open caption except for this one track. ASL Cafe has no signs, no voiceover, and um, so if you're wanting to learn, it is an excellent way. Well, if you're wanting to practice your skill and hone your skills, this is an excellent way to do it. Uh, but you can look at you can uh, on your computer go to accessnetwork.tv and you'll find the silent network there. Okay, great. Those are all really great resources out there. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you. And I think we're going to just close off a bit early today. But I want to thank you again for being with us. Um, it's been a pleasure speaking with you and listening to your um, amazing experiences. So uh, everybody will speak with you again soon. Yeah. And have a great rest of your day. Okay. And if you have any questions, feel free to uh, send me an email. I'm always glad to talk to people. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.